Good afternoon, everybody. It's an exciting time to open the NAR21 uh, conference. A warm welcome to everyone. My name is Max Solfinger. I'm a faculty at the University of South Florida College of Public Health and chairing the postgraduate course with Dr. Connie Haley from the Southeastern National TB Center at the University of uh, Florida. The CDC Centers of Excellence for Training, Education and Medical Consultation postgraduate course will explore the On behalf of Max, I'm going to go ahead and keep going. I apologize to all of you. Um, Max, if you get your, your voice back, let me know. Uh, so, as Max was saying, the CDC Centers of Excellence for Training, Education, and Medical Consultation postgraduate course will explore the dynamic and essential role of the lab in the diagnosis and management of persons with defective basis. The main goal of this session is to provide an overview of the expanding toolbox available to TB, available to TB focused laboratories, and how to apply the results in the clinical setting. setting. Illustrious case examples will delve into the available testing methods, highlight changes in test interpretation and clinical application, and emphasize the importance of communication between the healthcare provider, the laboratory scientists, as part of a collaborative approach. If you have any questions or comments during the presentation, please use the chat box function. We will be monitoring that and we will do everything we can to address them. Uh, it is my understanding that we may be able to follow up with some Q&A writing after the course. And um, Angela, if you are with us, perhaps you could go ahead and share your screen. Thank, thank you, Connie. Um, so I serve as the branch chief for the division of TB elimination laboratory branch at CDC. Um, I also bring regards from Dr. Beverly Mechuk. Unfortunately, she had hoped to be able to join us today, but was unable to do so. Um, so uh, Connie, thank you for that introduction. Mark, please proceed with that file when you have it ready. Today, we'll be discussing the role of the laboratory in the diagnosis and management of tuberculosis. I think we can all agree that the laboratory is essential. The laboratory serves as a critical partner in the clinical care of patients and also in public health activities. The laboratory is tasked with providing rapid and reliable results for diagnosis, drug susceptibility testing results that help to guide clinical decision making for appropriate treatment of patients with tuberculosis, for performing tests to help monitor response to therapy, and also for genotyping to detect recent transmission and to identify outbreaks. So we share common goals among the laboratorians, uh, clinicians, and also TB programs in ensuring that patients get the best care and also in identifying and using the latest tools to help guide that clinical decision making. Ultimately, we were all in the fight to decrease transmission of tuberculosis. Communication is at the heart of the strong relationships that are important for patient care. This communication involves selecting the appropriate tests to conduct in the laboratory. Communication for assistance with results interpretation, for guiding a quality specimen and collecting that and getting it transported to the laboratory appropriately for identifying and understanding when referral testing might be needed and what are the available options, test options through a referral. And also what is the anticipated turnaround time when laboratory results can be expected based on the test that is performed. So in today's conversation, we're going to share some practical laboratory perspectives. So just a few general considerations from the laboratory. We like to say that not all tests are equal. And that is true. Um, tests have different performance characteristics and are selected for different reasons. And also, one thing to keep in mind is that the more test types that are performed within or even between laboratories, the higher the likelihood that you may find discordant results among those tests. 
This is especially true when we think about drug susceptibility testing. And I think some of that might be highlighted in the case studies that we will review later on in this session. Laboratories are subject to regulatory compliance and, and are often constrained by resources. The laboratory always wants to help. Uh, but may be limited in what services can be provided due to these either regulatory or resource constraints. But again, understanding what might be available um, through a referral network is really important. And finally, we all wish, believe me when I say this, that M tuberculosis grew faster. Um, unfortunately, the growth-based results do take time, especially if repeat testing is needed. But I will say that the laboratory is always open and available to have discussions about um, expected turnaround times and why test results may be pending. So back to that um, discussion we had just a few slides back about communication being at the heart of these things, please contact the laboratory if you have questions about results that are pending. So what are those expected turnaround times? Well, you'll see on the left hand side here the results and it sort of takes you through that menu of a full panel of mycobacteriology testing. And then on the right hand side, you see the recommended turnaround times and these are based on US guidelines. So on the left hand side for acid fast bacilli smear, the anticipated turnaround time is within 24 hours of laboratory receipt of the specimen. For nucleic acid amplification testing for direct detection of mycobacterium tuberculosis in a clinical specimen, that test result should be expected within 48 hours of laboratory receipt of the specimen. A positive culture for M tuberculosis, the goal is that that would be reported in less than or equal to 21 days of specimen receipt. Obviously, that can be um, changed. Or, or extended based on the bacterial burden from the specimen when it is originally submitted. So you could have a little bit longer time for turnaround for um, culture positivity. In terms of first line drug susceptibility testing, historically, the goal turnaround time was that those results would be available within 28 days from specimen receipt. However, in 2016, this was revised based, based on a multi-center evaluation to focus instead on the time from identification of a positive culture containing mycobacterium tuberculosis. So now the first line drug susceptibility test results, we target a turnaround time of less than or equal to 17 days from positive identification. And then finally, the molecular detection of drug resistance is also a very important test available um, for rapidly detecting drug resistance in mycobacterium tuberculosis. And there has, have not been any formally established expected turnaround times but it should be expected uh, quickly. So regarding nucleic acid amplification tests, um, the use of this type of methodology for direct detection in a clinical specimen should be the standard of care for those presumed to have TB. CDC updated their nucleic acid amplification test guidelines in 2009, and you see the uh, link to that at the bottom of the slide. But we know that continued progress is needed. These are data from 2011 through 2017 that look at, looked at the percent of reported TB cases in the United States that had a report of a nucleic acid amplification test result of either negative, positive, or not done as reported to our national TB surveillance system. And what you will note in the blue, which is not done, the percent of patients with a report of not done for this particular test methodology decreased from just around 60% in 2011 to around 35% in 2017, um, reflective of an increasing use of nucleic acid amplification testing among our TB patients. And subsequently, you also see an increase in the report of negative and positive results over this same time frame. So a few considerations for culture versus rapid nucleic acid amplification tests. Again, rapid detection is key, both for patient care, for rapidly identifying individuals who may have tuberculosis, but also for those public health interventions to help um, eliminate potential ongoing transmission. We're not yet able to completely replace culture with the available methods that we have, culture still remains the most sensitive method. Although um, there are good tests uh, available um, 
for, for performing this type of testing uh, globally. Nucleic acid amplification tests do not differentiate live from dead organism. That's important to keep in mind. So a patient who has been um, treated for TB for a while may be shedding dead organism and that nucleic acid will still be detected by these types of tests. That's why typically most of these, for, for example, gene expert, you would uh, test specimen from a patient who has been on treatment for less than um, a certain number of days, which I think is three days in the case of gene expert. The laboratory, um, well, let me move back up to the bullet point, the previous bullet point, um, that some TB patients will have both a negative culture and a negative nucleic acid amplification test result, but still may be deemed to have a clinical or uh, provider provided diagnosis of tuberculosis based on either signs or symptoms or chest x-ray. The laboratory may not have validated uh, multiple matrices for molecular testing. This is especially true when it comes to extrapulmonary sources. Um, some laboratories do not have um, either the capacity because of um, issues with obtaining those specific matrices to complete a validation or um, are less comfortable with doing an off-label, um, a validation for off-label use of an FDA approved assay. But this goes back to those statements about referral networks and understanding what may be available through different sources. And a communication and discussion with your laboratory is really important to identify where those resources uh, may be obtained. Another thing we'll talk about that will be highlighted in one of our case studies is that testing for pathology samples when a sample may not be viable for culture is also an option. So when speaking about nucleic acid amplification testing, we also want to highlight the use of these results to guide decision making in use of airborne infection isolation practices. And in 2015, the US FDA approved expanded claims for the expert MTB RIF assay related to its use, the results in the use of guiding decision making for airborne infection isolation. In 2016, the National TB Controllers Association, in collaboration with the Association of Public Health Laboratories, issued guidance. And the consensus statement um, you see listed here with the URL at the bottom of this slide. And in this consensus statement, um, indica they indicated, these groups indicated that uh, expert NTB RIF um, could be used based on negative results from one or two sputum specimens as these were predictive of results of two or three AFB smears being negative. However, they did include the caveat that sputum test results alone should not be the only criteria used for decision making. So now let's move to considerations for growth-based drug susceptibility testing and molecular detection of drug resistance. Assays for molecular detection of drug resistance are not necessarily equal. And this goes back to that statement that I made earlier about performance characteristics, but also of importance to note for assays that may rapidly detect drug resistance are questions like what loci are being examined? Um, how much of the, of the particular locus of interest is examined? What samples is, are we testing directly from a clinical specimen or is culture isolate um, required? And what are the output and results that we can expect from this type of assay? So it's important to understand all of this information to um, understand what information is being provided back by the test that's performed, but also the limitations and the expected turnaround time. One other thing to keep in mind is that heteroresistant populations, which can be a mix of susceptible and resistant organisms, can sometimes cause discordant results. And this will also be highlighted in one of our case studies, as we often see heteroresistance with chloroquinolones. Another thing to keep in mind is that we wish we could promise you that whole genome sequencing would solve all our problems, but um, alas, it does not, although it is a very helpful methodology. And also, what is true for one drug may not be true for another. And here's an example. Um, you often hear us say that silent mutations in RPOB do not result in rifampin resistance. However, a silent mutation at another locus in the FABG1 MAVA with a leucine 203 leucine substitution does result in, in resistance, in this case to isoniazid, through the formation of a cryptic promoter. 
So we can't say across the board that silent mutations are never associated with, with resistance. We have to understand the differences uh, between drugs. Also of importance with use of probe-based probe -based methods, such as expert mtb rif is that there's a need for confirmation of the detection of rifampin resistance by a sequencing-based method. In 2013, an MMWR from CDC was released um, recommending that anytime the expert assay indicates rifampin resistance is detected, that genetic loci associated with both rifampin and isoniazid resistance should be sequenced and that if rifampin resistance is confirmed, that there should also be follow-up for rapid detection of mutations associated with other first and second line drugs, and that all molecular testing in these cases should prompt growth-based drug susceptibility testing to also help provide additional information. CDC established the Molecular Detection of Drug Resistance Service in 2009, and in a publication that we released in JCM in 2015, we found that 19% of the samples that we received for our MDDR service where rifampin resistance had been detected by the expert n 2 rif assay, that the specific mutation was actually a silent mutation. And in this case, these silent mutations were not associated with resistance. Therefore, these individ individual uh, patients did not have rifampin resistant disease. Additionally, 14% of those submissions had mutations that were associated with low-level rifampin resistance. And we know that in some cases, and we'll talk more about this later in our case studies, that low-level rifampin resistance associated mutations may be missed by growth-based methods, but still have clinical relevance. So when we start to talk about molecular detection of drug resistance, there's lots of new terms, and this is just a word cloud that sort of brings together all of these different terms that we might use to describe the testing and the results. And it really is like learning a whole new language. Um, to date, there is not a, a standardized way in which we report these types of results. There's no single standard for terminology or nomenclature. And so different labs that are performing this type of testing may use different language for how they report it. For example, um, one laboratory may report a silent mutation where another might use the term synonymous mutation or mutation detected but not clinically significant. And you see the other examples there in terms of when there is a non-synonymous mutation or a mutation detected that is clinically significant. Um, abbreviations may be different as well. Uh, some laboratories may choose to, to use a single uh, letter abbreviation for amino acids where others may use the three letter abbreviation and even numbering systems can be different. So all of this can sometimes lead to confusion, potentially having the um, impact on in, in impacting interpretation. And so it, again, underscores the need for good communication and focus tools and resources to help us all understand these types of results better. I also wanted to include an overview of a recently released proposed ideal algorithm for mycobacteriology testing that was in the clinical microbiology reviews in 2018. And draw your attention to, to one of the things that's included here is that universally what's being suggested in this algorithm is that all patients who are nucleic acid amplification test positive would receive an MDR screen up front. So in our ideal world, this would happen um, very quickly so that we would be able to identify those patients with MDR early on and to help um, guide subsequent testing that might be performed to help get additional information for guiding appropriate treatment for these patients. But one thing to keep in mind is that sometimes the nature of testing for TB to get a full panel of testing can be quite piecemeal and that multiple laboratories may be needed. The more complex cases that you have, um, highly drug resistant cases, those will likely involve testing at more than one laboratory. And again, communication becomes very important among the laboratory healthcare providers and TB program that may be engaged. CDC in, in the US sponsors the TB Centers of Excellence for Training, Education, and Medical Consultation for Strengthening Clinical Practice and Patient Care. And I've included the URL here. 
And there are experts available at these centers that can help um, provide consultation in these really complex cases and to help uh, sort of navigate through the, the, the piecemeal nature and some of the different types of test results that might be received. So what are the types of molecular assays that are used in the TB laboratory and what are, what are their purposes? Um, we've already talked a lot about the direct detection of mycobacterium tuberculosis by nucleic acid amplification testing. The most common algorithm that we see for this is among a new AFB smear positives and smear negatives on request. I think the ideal algorithm would be that all patients have a nucleic acid amplification test to receive. We did discuss that this, uh, these results can be used for patient isolation decisions and also initiation of therapy, and you see the different platforms that may be available there. We haven't talked so much about identification, but um, obviously molecular assays have a very important role in helping to identify uh, mycobacterium tuberculosis or other non-tuberculous mycobacteria when we have an AFB positive culture. And really focus on rapid and accurate identification of mycobacterium tuberculosis and helping to guide that an appropriate initiation of therapy. And then finally, the detection of drug resistance mutations, which depending on the test could be used directly on a clinical specimen from that material or um, from culture material when we know we have a positive culture for mycobacterium tuberculosis. So whole genome sequencing, just a word. Um, it's a DNA sequencing method that uses next generation sequencing or high throughput technology. And the data are useful for a number of, of different um, elements. We can use those data to look at genetic relatedness to understand if there's potential recent transmission or outbreaks or clusters of concern. We can identify mutations in genetic loci known to be associated with drug resistance. We can detect novel mutations. And one of the things that's really nice about it is that for clinical care, it can replace other tests that may be performed. For example, whole genome sequencing could also replace other assays that might be used for a, that initial identification in a positive culture. So one other term that you may hear about is something called targeted next generation sequencing. Um, both whole genome and targeted next generation sequencing, and when we talk about targeted, as you see here with the bottom bullet, we're really talking about sequencing specific areas of the genome. Um, what's really powerful about this is that it can be performed directly from material from a patient um, specimen, but also from material um, from cultures. Whereas whole genome sequencing, at least um, for the time being, seems to be primarily um, most directed toward material from culture isolate. But in that, you're sequencing most of the genome. Either way, you're still looking at specific loci known to be associated with resistance. And for the clinical management, you still need to understand what you're looking at and to be able to report that in a way that's meaningful. This type of testing is still limited to primarily reference laboratories, but it is adaptable to provide um, high quality, clinically actionable results, and both provide large amounts of data. So recently, there have been some changes proposed to how we do our growth-based drug susceptibility testing in the laboratory. Um, in 2018, the World Health Organization issued a technical report with updates. This was based on a systematic review of minimum inhibitory concentrations and sequencing data for phenotypically wild type and phenotypically non-wild type strains. And you see the anti-TB drugs that were evaluated and are listed there. The Clinical and Laboratory Standards Institute also around the same time released um, two new documents, an updated M24 and also an M62 that also updated some of the critical concentrations for second line drugs and midget, um, provided breakpoints and interpretive criteria for MIC testing to ethambutol, rifampin, and isoniazid, and also um, provided additional information on molecular testing challenges with low level resistance, especially for rifampin, which we've talked about, and pharmacodynamics and pharmacokinetics. And then most recently, within the past few weeks, um, the World Health Organization again has released a technical report, this time focused on a systematic review of critical concentrations um, 
for the erythromycins and also for isoniazid. And the technical report that was recently released um, resulted in a proposed revision to the critical concentrations used for growth-based drug susceptibility testing in 7-H10 Middlebrook and Midget for rifampicin, but currently no change was recommended for those um, used for testing of isoniazid. So I've mentioned several times these low-level rifampin resistance associated mutations in RPOB. In the literature, these are often referred to as disputed, discordant, low-level, or mutations associated with borderline resistance. These have been reported, and I've included several um, uh, citations there at the bottom of the slide, with a high degree of treatment failure or relapse in rifampin-based regimens. And you see the examples here. Um, so when the leucine, just to point out a thing, when the leucine 430 proline, that is um, the M tuberculosis numbering system. That is the same thing as the leucine 511 proline, which you may see in the literature or in a clinical report. That is using um, the E. coli numbering system. So it's just two different numbering systems, but they, they are the same thing. So you see both uh, a number of those examples listed there of mutations that have been indicated as being low level resistance. And one of the things to keep in mind is that these, although clinically significant, they often test as susceptible in growth-based methods. So we wanted to share just a little bit from um, questions that we've received in the laboratory um, and also uh, questions that some of our colleagues have received and provide some answers that, that may help us today in some of our case discussions. So regarding the molecular detection of drug resistance, um, some of the questions that we get are, when is DNA sequencing needed? Well, as I've mentioned, in some areas, this is universally performed. Um, we have examples from um, our colleagues at Wadsworth Center in New York State in the US and also from Public Health England, where from a clinical perspective, this is universally performed. Um, for others, it's primarily a clinical decision based on a number of factors that could include the patient history or other known laboratory results or other clinical indications. For example, this may be considered in a situation where, um, as I mentioned, the gene expert indicates RIF resistance is detected. So we would want to get that somewhere where we can understand the specific mutation that is being um, indicated by that result. Um, it may be a situation where it's a known contact of someone to a drug resistant case of TB. Those would all be appropriate for trying to um, get samples for DNA sequencing. So if the sequencing shows that there are no mutations, can I confidently use those drugs for treatment? Well, at the end of the day, that is a clinical decision, but um, would definitely advise that you find out more about the test that's performed. Was it a sequencing assay? Was it probe-based? And if it was sequencing, um, what loci were examined? The Cryptic Consortium and the 100,000 Genomes Project found that whole genome sequencing data correlated well with growth-based DST and was very good uh, for prediction of susceptibility to first-line drugs um, with growth-based susceptibility um, for the loci that, that were evaluated as part of this. So things like RPOB, INHA, CAT-G, EMDB for ethambutol, um, though they found very good correlation showing that these molecular predictors um, with good, good sequencing could, could reliably indicate or predict resistance. And I mentioned previously that Wadsworth Center in New York um, universally performs whole genome sequencing. And they had reported in a publication that I've listed here in JCM in 2017 that they found a um, susceptible predictive value of 96% with the use of whole genome sequencing with greatly improved turnaround time and were able to um, eliminate a number of tests in their laboratory. So what does it mean if there's an unknown mutation? This may also be indicated as novel. Um, how should I proceed with patient treatment? Well, when a laboratory reports a mutation as unknown or novel, it's one that the laboratory has either not detected previously 
or has limited data supporting the association of that mutation with resistance. And again, how to proceed with treatment is a clinical decision, but in these cases um, should always ensure that growth-based testing proceeds uh, whenever possible. So how often do you see discrepancies between molecular and growth-based drug susceptibility methods? We would like to tell you it never happens, but it does happen due to several different reasons, and these are not all inclusive. Um, there could be discordance uh, or discrepancies um, because of the limit of detection of the specific assay that's used. Um, there could be differences because of the specific genetic loci that are examined, and there could be mutations outside of those areas. Um, molecular testing of the specimen could yield a different result than molecular testing of an isolate um, that was subcultured from that, uh, that was cultured from that specimen. And that could be due to differences in bacterial populations, or there could be unknown mechanisms of resistance. And one that is probably um, one of the more common ones that you may see or encounter is related to isoniazid resistance in that with looking at INHA, INHA promoter region, um, the CATG315 region, we're probably getting about 85% um, you know, of the resistance um, looking at those particular areas of the genome. And then because we're, we're missing some of it um, with the loci that are being examined, those might later pop up as isoniazid resistance in growth-based drug susceptibility testing. So you end up with that discrepancy between the new, two methods. But it, it, but it really has to do with um, likely some of this uh, second bullet point here about specific, the specific genetic loci examined and mutations that might have been um, present that are outside of those regions examined by the molecular test. So if results from multiple tests in the same or different labs are different, which one is right and which one is wrong? This is a question we've gotten before. And I, my advice would be not to consider right or wrong. Um, again, the results depend on the sample tested and the assay that's performed and those specific performance characteristics. So understanding all of that, and again, goes back to that um, emphasis on communication with the laboratory is really, really rich and, and really important. So I want to talk a little bit about our MDDR service at CDC that I mentioned previously. This is a CLIA compliant uh, service. We do it to be able to provide in a rapid way information for both first and second line drugs. It's available free of charge to all of the 50 states in the U.S., to U.S. territories and U.S. affiliated Pacific Islands. Um, we also collaborate with APHL to provide um, shipping free of charge so that that is not an obstacle to getting those things to us. And we provide clinical consultation on those results as they are available. The turnaround time for us is, is pretty good, um, less than or equal to four days in most cases from the time that we receive those samples in our laboratory. And these are the acceptable testing criteria that you see here. We accept isolates that have been positively identified as mycobacterium tuberculosis complex and also sediments or processed specimens that have been found to, to contain mycobacterium tuberculosis through nucleic acid amplification testing. We will also um, uh, obtain from time to time DNA extracts from, fish, from fixed excuse me, tissue samples, and we will also attempt um, amplification and sequencing from those as well, although our success is not quite as high as it is with some of the other materials mentioned here. So, uh, what are the acceptable submission criteria for us? Well, really, it's a patient who is at higher risk for rifampin resistance or MDRTD. And this could be because the individual um, has, a, has a history um, that, that um, they have either spent a lot of time um, in a location where there may be high rates of drug resistance or have been exposed to uh, a known case where there was drug resistance involved. You're uh, on the clinical side. Um, you may see a lack of clinical response to therapy, or the individual was previously treated for TB. We also accept samples for cases of public health importance when there's known rifampin resistance, either through molecular or growth-based methods. Uh, for those patients who have an inability to tolerate first-line drugs, where it may be important to have that rapid information about second-line drugs, for example, especially fluoroquinolones, 
um, I mentioned the DNA extracts. We get a lot of those through a partnership with our CDC Infectious Disease Pathology Branch, or IDPB. They will get um, fixed tissue samples in, do an extract, and then that gets passed along to us for our MDVR service. And then finally, for mixed culture or non-viable samples, where there really are a lot of complications and challenges to getting a pure culture for growth-based uh, drug susceptibility testing. And really other reasons, um, I, I would just encourage folks if they have interest to contact us. And our sample submissions um, come through in the US through our state or territorial public health laboratories. And subsequently our reporting um, also works its way back through those same um, uh, facilities as well, primarily through our public health laboratory network in the US. And this is just an example of an MDVR report. Um, we had historically been using Sanger and pyro sequencing. And so if you look on the right hand side, it's kind of a, a, the results portion of our test is kind of blown up there. We list the drug, um, the locus that we're looking at, and we do provide additional details in our user guide um, about these particular loci. Um, the mutation, we currently include both the nucleic acid um, change and also the amino acid change as applicable. And then we provide information on interpretation to sort of help guide uh, our submitters in understanding what these results mean. But we are transitioning to a targeted next generation sequencing assay. And you'll see on the far right hand side here in blue, the additional loci that are being added. Um, we are discontinuing TIL A. Um, from our um, list of amplicons. So we'll no longer be including that for the capriomycin resistance. But we've added the um, full length open reading frame for cat G because we know there are some mutations in that open reading frame associated with isoniazid resistance. So that should help increase our sensitivity there. We have um, RPLC and RRL for linazolid, ATPE, RVO678, and PEPQ for midaclin. Um, so we, we are really looking forward to getting this uh, in, in place very soon. I mentioned the CDC Infectious Diseases Pathology Branch and our partnership. Um, if you would like additional information, the, I've listed the email address and also the URL here. The requesters are asked to first contact their state health department and then reach out to IDPB for consultation and approval of those submissions. And as I mentioned, um, they're, they will provide instructions if you're interested in MDDR as part of that process. Um, they'll, they'll instruct you on how to make that request. So in summary, I hope that I've conveyed to you today the importance that the laboratory plays really as an integral member of the team um, and the essential role that they, and I should say we uh, as the laboratory, play in patient-centered care. Uh, regular communication is really, really important. And I know sometimes it's, it's easy to um, send an email, but sometimes just picking up the phone is just a really great way to try to get at the heart of the information that you may need. And these kind of consultations um, can focus on test selection, results interpretation, but also understanding the network of laboratory and the, and the, the additional testing that may be available through referral networks. There is increasing use of molecular assays for both diagnostic purposes and molecular detection of drug resistance. At least for now, we still need to have those cultures performed. Um, but increasingly, we're seeing that the genetic prediction of drug resistance has very good correlation with phenotypic uh, results for, for first-line drugs and also increasingly for second-line drugs as our knowledge base is continuing. And I mentioned those two examples, those two publications for Public Health England and um, Wadsworth with the good predictability for susceptibility for first line drugs. The score net results, uh, unfortunately, are still going to occur from time to time. But again, it's really important to reach out and speak with the lab, have a good understanding of those key performance characteristics, and understand the specific sample that might have been, tech, might have been tested to help work through those issues. And I want to end by just acknowledging some of the individuals at CDC and counterparts at some of our state public health laboratories and appreciate uh, their contributions to this presentation. So with that, I um, would be very happy to answer any questions. 
Thank you, Angela. Uh, perhaps uh, just one short uh, comment about the uh, questions we uh, saw in the uh, uh, chat, because we are, of course, uh, a little bit behind the uh, schedule. If you would like to just mention uh, uh, one, and then I would like to uh, continue then with the program. Thank you, Max. I think I will um, answer a question that we had several about around the timeframes when you can expect to get results back for cultures. Um, the, the information that I was providing in the presentation has to do with um, anticipation of a positive culture. And I put in the question and answer, you might want to um, look in there, but there's a link to a paper that we, a study we did a few years back looking at time to detection of positive cultures uh, and among several different sites. And what we found is that for diagnostic specimens, um, most of those, almost all of those were positive within 28 days, whereas for follow-up specimens, um, it was 35 days. So I saw in the, the questions, it was um, six or eight weeks, and that has to do with the report out of a final um, negative culture. The standard uh, time frame for the most common commercial system that we use for liquid culture is 42 days before it will be indicated as negative. And sometimes laboratories will hold solid media for up to eight weeks. So those time frames um, are, are more related to report of a negative culture result. Additionally, obviously the bacterial burden will dictate sort of how quickly things become positive with, if there's more bacteria in the sample, those cultures will be positive earlier than if there are less. Thank you so much, uh, Angela, and uh, thank you again for the very, very informative uh, presentation.